Good afternoon, everyone. I think we can start. Um, thank you very much for joining our briefing regarding the report on non-implementation of court judgments from the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights. My name is Jakub Jaraczewski. I'm a research coordinator at Democracy Reporting International, and I will have the pleasure of moderating today's event. Um, first of all, a couple of uh, necessary introductions. Uh, first of all, a few words about our organizations. The authors of this report are the European Implementation Network, um, uh, uh, a network of lawyers, civil society organizations, and communities from across the Council of Europe region who advocate for timely and throughout implementation of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. EIN is uh, based in Strasbourg and works from there on improving the situation with regards to that court's judgments. And Democracy Reporting International is an NGO and think tank based in Berlin, working on strengthening democracy and the rule of law worldwide. Um, we're active in multiple places in the whole world and context this, but for this particular meeting today, we work as part of the reconstitution program, which is aimed at strengthening the rule of law inside of the European Union. And one of our focuses is, of course, the um, EU itself and the um, judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And so our organizations came together a while ago to start working on a joint report on implementation of judgments from uh, the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, we are now publishing the third iteration of our joint report. Um, this report has been possible thanks to works of uh, my colleagues from DRI and EIN, but also thanks to gracious support from Stiftung Mercator, a German foundation, which is uh, 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 helping us with our work on the rule of law. Just, uh, I'm going to leave the exact details about the content of the report and the recommendations to our fantastic speakers, whom I will introduce in a moment, but I will just very briefly touch upon some general uh, themes and ideas behind this uh, report. So. We wanted to tackle the issue of non-implementation of judgments from both courts, as both the Luxembourg and the Strasbourg court are facing the issue of uh, countries, EU member states, we are focusing in this report solely on the current EU member states, not respecting the courts and not implementing, not implementing their judgments. And of course, for those of you who know a little bit about these two courts, it's, uh, you'll probably not be not surprised that uh, a challenge for us in the work on this report has been that those courts are very different in terms of uh, the substance that they rule upon, the way cases can make their, find their way into those courts, but also in terms of what is the follow-up and uh, who and how is monitoring the implementation of those court's judgments. So this year we have tried to bring our analysis of both courts uh, together to be more consistent and more uh, comparable. I hope we've managed to do that to some degree and uh, you will see during the presentations how we decided to go about this, but this is an ongoing process which we will continue. And of course, the importance of uh, the report in today's meeting, uh, um, uh, the role of Council of Europe and the European Union as organizations that uh, uh, work on protecting uh, the rule of law and fundamental rights in their uh, member states, but also the increasing convergence of both organizations with uh, not only close cooperation in multiple areas, but also the ongoing process of the European Union aspiring to um, uh, accede to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, just uh, this week, we saw the presentation of the new European Commission, proposed European Commission, and then the mission letters issued by uh, 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 President Nomini von der Leyen. We've seen an aspiration for the European Union to um, uh, ratify the European Convention on Human Rights within the next five years. That's quite an ambitious goal, and we will be very interested to cover this. 
but also it shows how closely both organizations are converging, which leads to question where we are with the implementation of the judgments from the uh, both respective courts. And to speak about that, we have uh, asked our two fantastic experts uh, joining us today from uh, uh, the European Implementation Network is its director, Julieta Bizzoli. Julieta is an attorney at law and members of the Athens Bar Association, who leads EIN, and she has experience, extensive experience working in the human rights field, having previously worked at, among others, the uh, Council of Europe Department for Execution of Judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, and uh, 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 the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and also multiple other mm, uh, uh, initiatives uh, uh, with regards to human rights in Europe and beyond. Joining from DRI is Dr. Nina Tsaretelli, our research officer, uh, who works on reconstitution program, uh, where she, among other traces, analy analyzes the rule of law performance of EU member states. She's been involved in multiple of our outputs as part of the program, including the Judiciary Hub, our database of information about courts in the European Union, and of course, the implementation report as well. Um, prior to joining the ARI, uh, Nina held research positions at uh, the Masaryk University and the University of Oslo, and even previously uh, back in Georgia, she worked as a legal advisor for the Georgian government. That would be for now all from me, and I think that the way we're going to go about this is that we will ask our um, experts to provide their insight and then also talk about uh, recommendations which we are issuing in the report. And after that, we will open the floor to a Q&A session where uh, you, our dear guests, will have the opportunity to ask about the report and the state of implementation of judgments from both courts. So that would be all for me for now, and I'm handing over the mic to Julieta to present the part about the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you very much, Jakub. Good evening to everyone in the in the meeting room. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jakub, uh, the, the excellent moderation as, as, as always. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to be representing the European Implementation Network uh, this afternoon in presenting to you uh, what constitutes our indeed uh, flagship report in cooperation with uh, my fantastic colleagues from um, Democracy Reporting International. Uh, Implementation concerns lies at the heart of the work of EAN. It is the reason that justifies the existence of EAN, but linking the problems that we have um, established uh, with the rule of law problem, it's an innovation of the last few years. Uh, it is part of our deepening work on the subject matter, and uh, we are grateful for the response this, this um, work is met with. Uh, on advocacy level, but also at the level of support for our research um, through the Stiftung Mercator in particular, but uh, also beyond. Um, without further ado, because we have uh, several uh, important findings to uh, share with you, I will start uh, sharing my screen now for my uh, presentation in substance. So as uh, Jakub mentioned, this is the third iteration of, uh, of this um, important research, uh, which um, uh, occupied uh, many people from, from the side of uh, both uh, the EAN and DRI. Um, while we have done our best this year uh, to bridge the gap uh, between the, um, the, the two different jurisdictions, um, we um we are still uh, faced with some um uh, limitations uh, in our uh, approach which we have uh, tried to um to shrink as much as possible this year um let me uh so um 
from an, an uh, a Council of Europe perspective and from uh, then an EIM perspective, uh, we are uh, passing the message successfully until now to the European Commission uh, that ECTHR implementation uh, other than uh, a very important issue for the credibility of the court and for the upholding of uh, the human rights uh, enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights is also a very important uh, rule of law matter. Uh, this is for two reasons. Um, Firstly, um, the European uh, courts, both of them, have identified serious problems with uh, the control of uh, the executive authorities over judiciaries. Um, there are also beyond that a range of judgments concerning the protection of fundamental values that are necessary for maintaining a democratic way of life in a state governed by the rule of law. Uh, these cover issues such as the protection of free speech, the right to peaceful protest, the need for a pluralistic media environment, and the protection of the rights of vulnerable groups. Failure to adhere to these uh, specific rulings can directly impact the quality of uh, checks and balances and the overall state of the rule of law in a given member state necessitating particular attention. Uh, I think uh, up to this point, our uh, views with uh, DRI and our scope of research uh, very much aligns. But um, as EIN, our research goes one step further and um, uh, we make the point that um, on the other hand, non-compliance with both ECTHR and CJU rulings, regardless of their subject matters, uh, is intrinsically a rule of law issue. And this is because respect for court rulings is integral to a state that is run by laws rather than by the absolute power of government. Uh, in other words, they constitute the operative tool by which government and power is kept in check by the judiciary. Um, which means that if governments are able to exercise power without the limits placed upon them by courts, for instance, by ignoring court judgments, including the highest European instances judgments, then the rule of law is compromised. Um, on the basis of this uh, uh, approach of, of the problematic um, and in application of uh, our uh, methodology, uh, about which I will give further uh, clarifications in a moment, uh, we have come down to the key data uh, for um, this year. Uh, I'm presenting them to you uh, briefly before we go uh, into them uh, more, more specifically. As of 1st of January 2024, there were 624 leading ECTHR judgments awaiting implementation across the EU space, which is slightly up from 616 in 2022 and 602 in 2021. 44% of the leading judgments from the past decade, and I will explain in a bit what leading judgments means, remain unimplemented compared to 40% in 2022 and 37.5% in 2021. Whereas the average length of time leading ECTHR judgments concerning EU states have been pending implementation in 2023 was five years and two months compared to five years and one month in 2022 and four years and four months in 2021. Uh, there is a um, quite extensive methodological explanation included in our report. I will not go uh, into details into that. I will just explain a few notions that are necessary for you to understand uh, our work. First of all, uh, by leading cases, we uh, mean uh, we we utilize the, the the basic distinction also performed by the Council of Europe and the Committee of Ministers uh, themselves in classifying the cases. Leading cases are the cases that identify uh, a given problem for the first time in a given jurisdiction. This is opposed to the repetitive cases, which then can follow uh, once a problem is systemic, uh, which serves to identify the magnitude of the problem in a given jurisdiction. Because the adoption of necessary measures to, um, uh, to resolve the problem are linked to leading judgments, uh, the 
level of implementation, which means the level of adoption of the necessary measures required to comply with the court's judgment is better revealed by focusing on the number of um, of leading judgments. And this is why we have uh, we have chosen this um, uh, this number. Uh, other than that, um, the other um, um, indicators uh, concern the percentage of unimplemented leading judgments uh, that um, uh, remain from the last 10 years. Uh, this is important because the, um, uh, the longest uh, leading judgment remains unimplemented. The biggest indication that a serious problem exists, which is difficult to tackle, uh, the longest uh, the problem remains unresolved in the field of the respondent state concern, and the more um, uh, difficult the problem becomes, both at uh, state level, but also at Strasbourg level, because this means that repetitive cases in respect of the unresolved problem keep piling up and being filed with the court, creating a, a blockage to the court and all the subsequent institutions, including the implementation mechanism. The third um, um, indicator is the average time leading judgments have been pending implementation for. And uh, again, the longest time uh, a, a leading case remains unimplemented. Quite often, uh, the most, uh, the more um, uh, big and and important and complex the problem is, while taking into account that uh, several problems will of course require, by their nature, more time to be resolved. So, uh, by no means do we uh, advocate for swift and for for rather rushed and sloppy resolution of the problem. But again, uh, we, see, we, we see quite often that the average time is exceeded in a disproportionate, disproportionate, disproportionate I'm sorry, way. Uh, so these are the three indicators um, in, uh, in um, assessment of which qualifiers are applied according to a classification grid that you see before you. Um, these can range from very serious problem to moderate or low and very low. The number um, uh, for the overall assessment, um, we use these uh, qualifiers in an identical number, in a, in an identical uh, manner, I'm sorry, in a uniform uh, manner for all member states. Uh, but once a first level assessment has been made on the basis of these qualifiers, then uh, a second level comes, a final descriptive qualifier is applied to each country as excellent, good, etc. Um, which assessment is not, however, subject to a uniform formula. Uh, so the final, uh, absolutely final categorization of countries and the attribution of the final qualifier uh, cannot be carried out according to a rigid formula, as this would prevent uh, a sufficiently flexible analysis of diverging underlying circumstances and the different challenges that 27 EU states are faced with. Um, I have mentioned that the, 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 the majority of the elements uh, in this uh, next slide, I will just uh, highlight that uh, the number, the, uh, the absolute number of pending leading judgments in each country, uh, it is the one uh, that is uh, taken from the Council of Europe's uh, 2023 annual report of the Committee of Ministers. So our basis are the numbers presented by the relevant Council of Europe institutions themselves. The remaining two calculators have been uh, um, mined, so to say the relevant data have been mined, they have been calculated using the Council of Europe's Hudoc exec uh, website. So in any uh, case, all our um, for all our um, figures, we are relying on existing sources of the Council of Europe. Um, I just want to flag two issues. Uh, first of all, uh, we understand the limitations and we acknowledge the limitations of this methodology. Um, the cases that uh, are presented as non-implemented in our report um, may be the subject of ongoing reforms. We are not arguing that uh, these cases have never touched, uh, been touched upon and no progress whatsoever have been um, uh, uh, made in their respect. Uh, furthermore, the report does not quantify the severity of violations nor the complexity of the required reforms. Uh, 
Those are two inherent limitations uh, which um, are linked not only to our own methodology, but to the methodology of uh, any methodology used by different institutions to measure uh, implementation records. Um, there is no other there is no better system um, devised by now by anyone. The Council of Europe them, themselves measure impact by um, approaching cases as implemented or non-implemented, so open uh, or closed. Um, so unfortunately, we cannot do better than that. We just can uh, make the best use of the existing indicators possible uh, to present um, our findings. So to the substance, uh, which I think is the reason why we are all here, uh, this map presents the uh, the overview of the situation uh, in the countries. Uh, you will see that there's a color-coded um, grid uh, with um, deep green. We have... Uh, one country with excellent record, which is Sweden. Uh, then with a lighter green, we have a number of countries with a very good overall assessment. Uh, Denmark, Estonia, Luxembourg, Slovenia, Austria, Czechia, Finland. Um, no, I will stop to Slovenia, uh, which is the which are the countries that uh, have a very good uh, implementation record. Uh, then a number of countries with a lighter green, uh, which are still at the good level. Then with green, uh, uh, we have a number of countries um, uh, performing in a moderate manner. Implementation-wise, this includes Croatia, France, Germany, Lithuania, Portugal. Then we start them with the most problematic situations. Belgium, Cyprus, Malta, Slova Slovakia, and Spain uh, have um, a moderately, moderately uh, poor um, average uh, uh, record of implementation and are uh, sig uh, signaled by orange uh, in our grid. We have one country, my own native Greece, uh, which uh, is problematic in implementation. And then um, Bulgaria, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Romania, uh, which present the most serious problems um, implementation-wise. Uh, among them, uh, we have uh, uh, a few countries where the rule of law problem in the strictest sense that I refer to is the most pronounced. These are Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, um, and Spain. Um, we will uh, we can see the evolution in respect of these numbers. First of all, um, in respect of uh, of the absolute numbers uh, of of the cases pending, we see that. Um, uh, this year, as we said, we had 624 judgments pending implementation at the end of 2023 compared to uh, 602 uh, in 2021. Um, um, this demonstrates that uh, uh, the, the, the increase might be small, but still this means that uh, the uh, member states, the court rather, uh, issues decisions faster than the than, than the member states can uh, implement. Um, as regards the proportion of leading judgments from the last 10 years that um, have not been implemented, again, we see a rise of 44% uh, in 2023 compared to 375 Um uh, we have here uh, in 2021, we have here um, at, at least um, uh, 15 uh, states with um, uh, more than 50% of their judgments um, uh, pending implementation for uh, for more than 10 years. This is a very important problem uh, um, because this um, uh, adds to uh, to to the the very big impact on on the Strasbourg system, as we have seen. Uh, the most important um, problem uh, in the EU space is recorded here in respect of Hungary, um, a country with overall a problematic record, but particularly problematic in respect of this um, metric, as seventy six percent of the leading judgments uh, rendered in the last ten years have has not been implemented. It is followed by uh, Italy with 65% uh, of uh, non-implemented judgments rendered in the last mm, 10 years. Uh, as regards the average time leading uh, 
judgments have been pending implementation. Again, there is a small um, uh, increase here. Um, the, the figure stands at five years and, and two months uh, at the end of 2023. As said, uh, length implementation uh, can be justified on some occasions. We don't want speedy solutions. We want durable, sustainable solutions. And uh, for this to happen on many occasions, depending on the systemic nature of the problem, this takes time. Uh, but we are, uh, our problem here is with the uh, with uh, those types of cases that should not take so long to be uh, implemented, where the reasons behind this uh, lengthy uh, non-implementation are other reasons, reasons of resistance, reasons of uh, weakness of the national implementation mechanism, reason of, reasons linked to the sensitivity of uh, the underlying subject matter, etc. Uh, here, what is interesting is that countries with overall good implementation record can nevertheless record uh, big uh, implementation times. Uh, one example here is Ireland, uh, which figures in green in our grid and has a good overall record and only two leading cases pending implementation, but nevertheless, um, the average time for those uh, cases uh, is 11 years and eight months. Uh, the same with Finland, which is one of the countries that was uh, the, uh, the the nice surprise uh, of, of last year. Uh, Finland has recorded a big, uh, it has improved uh, very much in their implementation record, uh, but um, still uh, their implementation time remains, uh, of the remaining two cases remains at 10 years and three months. I will pass quickly to the thematic uh, trends because I will uh, need to stop my presentation soon. Uh, as um, I mentioned in our report for the first time, an effort was made to uh, to approach thematically the issues uh, that can create uh, most often implementation stumbling blocks. And this is with a view to supplementing our analysis with qualitative elements other than the uh, quantitative ones. Uh, to, uh, to the extent that was possible, we tried with our colleagues from DRI to uh, coordinate and look at as, as, as similar thematics as possible. This was, uh, it was not possible that they be completely uniform, uh, but a certain effort is done and we will continue working in the uh, direction of harmonization of our approach in the next editions of the report. Of course, the first uh, the first subject matter that we looked into is independence and impartiality of the judiciary as per the link of the report with rule of law matters in any event. Uh, there are uh, 13 leading uh, <coughs> judgments uh, concerning this matter pending implementation, <coughs> excuse me, in seven EU member states. Uh, some states have bigger problems than others in this respect. Uh, those are Bulgaria, Hungary and Poland, but other states like uh, Spain and Romania also present uh, considerable challenges in this respect. Uh, we then looked into uh, policing treatment and failure to effectively investigate violence by police or, or third parties. Um, again, 11 EU member states um, present this type of problem, um, which is more pronounced in Greece, Hungary, um, Italy and Romania. Rights in detention, so um, uh, rights touching upon uh, a very vulnerable category of uh, the European population uh, is also a cross-cutting theme across 14 EU member states. Uh, more than um, 30 leading judgments uh, across Europe um, deal with this matter. And um, we have, of course, um, uh, several member states where the, the matter is more um, pronounced, like, um, for example, Greece, um, Belgium or uh, Romania. Uh, 16 leading judgments pertain to the very important issue of uh, freedom of expression, uh, which is in itself linked with the checks and balances that are uh, inherent in, uh, um, a, in a country that adheres to the rule of law. Um, Again, uh, some of the same suspects like Greece, Hungary, Romania, but also Lithuania, Spain and Slovakia uh, find themselves uh, in, in a situation of, uh, of difficulty to deal with uh, such judgments.
an important subject matter, uh, which is identified in a relative, rel relatively small number of judgments pending implementation uh, in terms of the states concerned, um, is mental health and psychiatry. Uh, but it is a very important thematic uh, as regards the consequences of uh, respective violations for the persons concerned. Bulgaria and Romania here are by far uh, the countries with the biggest problems in this respect. LGBTIQ plus rights is uh, one issue that we also looked upon more closely this year as a thematic uh, um, capable of generating more stumbling blocks. Bulgaria, Croatia, Hungary, Lithuania and Romania have leading pending uh, cases um, on this topic. Um, some of the issues that create the stumbling block is the legal gender um, recognition concerns, the recognition of protection of same-sex uh, partnerships uh, and deficiencies in investigating homophobic crimes. Asylum and migration is uh, an, a vast issue for uh, for um, uh, the the European Court of Human Rights and the implementation mechanisms, with um, more than thirty leading judgments on these matters, covering a vast range of rights that are infringed upon uh, and concerning thirteen EU member states. It has not been possible to dive more uh, uh, consistently into those uh, subject matters, other than making this global. Um, findings about numbers in this edition. Uh, I know that our colleagues have looked into those matters much more consistently and uh, our own ECTHR related um, research will be much more focused on this matter um, next year. I will stop here with the substantive part of my presentation. Apologizing to Jakub, I have taken uh, two or three minutes more and to Nino, but um, uh, I will stop here. Uh, thanking you while well, thanking you for your attention, and I will get back with the recommendations we propose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rieta, for the presentation of the European Court of Human Rights side of the report. And we will, without further ado, now shift over to Luxembourg Court with uh, Dr. Nina Seretelli presenting the CGEU part of the report. Nina, floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Jakob. Uh, and now I will, I hope you see my presentation. I will follow up uh, on uh, with the uh, data that we collected regarding the um, state compliance with the rulings of the Court of Justice of the European Union. I will um, refer further to this court as a CGEU to make it easier. Uh, so I will start with the methodology and how we collected our data uh, and then to help you to kind of navigate the report and then I will present briefly uh, the quantitative data that we collected and then the qualitative data where we tried to really show that it's not really a technical legalistic issue but really something that has uh, the non-compliance has significant implications and effects on thousands of individuals uh, in terms of their ability to have their cases discussed by independent courts or have uh, defend themselves before the courts, etc. So, uh, and finally, I will follow up with the recommendations. Uh, I very much agree with the Julieta's point that any, irrespective of subject matter, the compliance with any judgment of the court, European courts, either the ACTHR or CGEU, is a rule of law issue. However, for this part of the study for the CGU, we focused uh, particularly on a certain layer of the CGU case law, uh, the rulings that are focused on the rule of law. Uh, here, the big chunk of rulings is on the access to justice, uh, to independence of courts, to uh, access to information, to defend yourself uh, before the courts or access to a lawyer, etc but also uh, certain rulings related to the vulnerable communities and quality of checks uh, on the executive to prevent executive arbitrariness, etc. To be clear, this covers both uh, the rulings that um, resulted from the preliminary references from national courts that are the majority overall over the court stock at 70%, uh, and they are also in the majority in our data set, and also the cases that are brought by the European Commission to ask the court to rule on the compatibility of the laws and practices 
of a member states with the EU law. So with the data collection, we essentially followed up uh, the national judicial and political responses to those rulings that we identified as relevant, as rule of law related rulings. And in this, we were very much assisted by the national experts from the jurisdictions that we covered, that they analyzed the legislation and the rulings of the national courts, but also we complemented this with some scholarly work and uh, NGOs reports. Uh, and uh, the time frame that we are covering is five years. So all the rulings that are related to the rule of law that were issued between 1st of January 2019 to 1st of January 2024, but the compliance status is valid as of 1st of May 2024. Uh, briefly, so we focused on compliance and we identified three levels of uh, compliance, full or full adherence to the uh, CGU guidance on the EU law, then the partial here we uh, try to discern some level of progress, so some aspects of legislation or practice are adequate, but then not all courts or political uh, organs follow the CGU guidance. The example of this is mixed judicial practice. For example, we followed not only the referring courts and how they implemented the CGU guidance, but also uh, the other courts that ruled on the same case or uh, again, other courts who ruled on similar cases. So usually the picture is quite mixed in many jurisdictions. And uh, ultimately we identified also the countries that uh, uh, did not manage to comply in any way uh, with the uh, CGU rulings. So is, this also includes the sham reforms where the status quo does not really essentially change. So with based on that, we identified three categories of compliers, good, moderate, and struggling compliers. So to explain how we attach this label to these countries. So good compliers, the definitive feature is that they have a very high percentage, 80% or more of rulings fully complied with. Uh, and moderate compliers have high, but not so high um, percentage of rulings that are fully complied with. And then struggling compliers have a very low percentage, but then they have a very high percentage of rulings where they made some progress, but it's not sufficient progress to really uh, consider it as complied with. Uh, with the, we also have included in the report, similarly to EIN, uh, individual profiles for uh, each uh, state that we covered. Uh, and in these individual profiles, we have quantitative data for each country uh, where we uh, refer to the number and percentage of rulings that were fully or partly uh, com uh, complied with and also not at all. And also we highlighted the rulings that were pending compliance for two or more years, assuming these are graver situations of non-compliance because they took relatively long to comply. Uh, we have a qualitative element where we identified patterns in the behavior of uh, courts, uh, especially top courts, constitutional courts, but also ordinary courts and political bodies in terms of responding to the CGU rulings. And then also I highlighted some of the rulings that we thought were most problematic. And finally, we included contextual data, uh, both quantitative from the rule of law index from World Justice Project, but also our, our own data where you would find some extra information about uh, the reason why we included this was because it really helps you understand as a reader uh, to uh, to what degree the uh, courts in these countries are really uh, independent. And uh, now the data quickly. Uh, so we covered uh, 201 uh, rule of law related rulings from 17 member states. We don't cover all EU, only 17 states. And uh, only half of the uh, rulings have been fully complied with. Uh, about 24% partial compliance, 49 rulings, and 11% or 22 rulings have not been complied with. Uh, we have one category impossible to establish. These are rulings that have really not been complied with, but uh, there's not enough data to really support uh, the statement. Uh, so we think more in line of uh, that this category might uh, amount to partial compliance or non-compliance. However, to focus on the rulings that have clearly been uh, co not complied with, either partly or not at all, these are 71, uh, and 60% of these rulings uh, have uh, been pending compliance for two years or more. Um, now, just to quickly to go through the, uh, the particular categories of countries, struggling compliers, we have these four, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Poland, and you can see that they have 
a very uh, relatively low percentage of fully complied rulings, uh, really high percentages of uh, partially complied rulings, and also significant percentages uh, with the non-complied rulings. Uh, but also these countries have um, uh, significant delays with implementation of those rulings that, that, that are pending uh, compliance, so two or more years. Uh, then we have moderate compliers. You can see uh, high, uh, relatively high percentages uh, of the full compliance, uh, but for example, Portugal has also uh, rulings that have only partly been complied with. And then we have good compliers, which have main definitive features that almost 80, 90, sometimes 100% of the rulings that we detected as rule of law relevant have been um, fully uh, complied with. Italy is problematic in this sense because the rulings that have not been uh, complied with fully uh, or uh, so certain actions are missing. Uh, this is uh, so do they have the rulings that have been pending for several years already in terms of legislative reform, even though it generally fits into the uh, good complier category. Um, we have several other uh, countries that because of the numbers are not very high, we did not include it to any category where we have one or two rulings with Sweden and uh, Finland, but those are partly complied with. Uh, and uh, so this is how our country profiles look. Um, that this is a similar profile for each country the covered by the study. And then we have also similarly to EIN the thematic uh, highlights. Um, here you can see the first two. Uh, one is the use of uh, or abuse of the judicial accountability mechanisms uh, against judges to pressure judges and also creating obstacles for them in terms of seeking preliminary references and adhering to the CGU guidance, for example, by applying to by disapplying the national law that's problematic. So in a way, um, precluding enforcement of the EU law. So these, in these cases, judges are the ones, a vulnerable category that is affected and subject to a variety of legal uh, measures. Uh, and then we have another category uh, that um, is a right of defense or access to the lawyer. Here is usually individual is affected because there is no, there is a legislation which precludes them to have access to information or to have access to the uh, court. Um, and uh, there are several other rulings like prosecutorial independence related with Germany, where the legislative proposal has been prepared to reform uh, the uh, to reform the um, power of the Minister of Justice to instruct to issue instructions to prosecutors in individual cases. And the draft keeps the power but imposes certain conditions, uh, even though there have been uh, also calls for completely removing the power. In any case, it's not yet implemented for several years now. So there, there are several other categories. I don't think I can cover all of the categories um, here. Uh, you can find uh, more details in the report. So uh, one has to do with the balance between uh, security uh, interest and personal data, location and traffic data in this category of cases. And then we have asylum and migration cases. Uh, two of them are brought by the commission that are listed here. Uh, and uh, these cases involve uh, barriers to the effective access to international uh, protection procedure uh, and also uh, rules and procedures in transit zones. With this regard, the commission went again to the court and uh, the uh, the significant fines were imposed in Hungary on that. So, and the final category is the civil society and academic institutions. So the legislation that imposes restrictions on the civil society organizations. And uh, another case uh, deals with the um, inspections of the, um, of the uh, ships that, um, uh, inspection of the ships uh, that are run by the humanitarian organizations for certain rescue operations. I think I have I reached the recommendations. Uh, however, uh, Jakob, um, could you tell me should I uh, proceed with recommendations now, or maybe um, Julieta steps in? How about you start with the recommendation, then we switch over to Julieta? Would that okay. be okay? Yes. Okay. So I'll continue now with the recommendations. So these are the recommendations that are addressing. Uh, the uh, European Commission in the first place and also EU institutions. Uh, and uh, so the first recommendation, we call for the better use of the enforcement tools. Uh, 
uh, the to secure compliance with the CGU rulings. And what we mean here is that we want a more forceful reaction in case of the rulings that have been uh, uh, have not been complied with for extensive periods of time persistently. Uh, example would be going uh, for the commission to go back to the court uh, and uh, ask the imposition ask for the imposition of the fines or uh, making uh, the uh, access to EU funds conditional on the uh, compliance with these rulings. Uh, the uh, mission statements actually uh, that uh, have been issued uh, also refer to the links between the uh, the recommendations in the rule of law report and the um, access to the funds. So maybe this is something that uh, we'll have to wait and see if that develops. Uh, the second, uh, we would uh, we call for uh, more systemic monitoring of the CGU rulings uh, compliance, which currently the uh, the rule of law report does not reflect systematically this type of data. So. Um, Monitoring and integration would be something that we re recommend. Uh, at the same time, the Commission, in doing so, uh, should we believe also rely on not only on the state input but also on the input of the independent experts and the CSOs that are working on the topic. Uh, and uh, this is in line also with the European Parliament resolution about creating the scoreboard of uh, implementation compliance status of uh, the European Court rulings related to the rule of law. Uh, and uh, so third would be the prioritization of the issue of compliance as a rule of law issue in the discussions with the EU member states from the Commission and EU institutions in general. And finally, uh, the funding for the initiatives that enhance the implementation of the European Court rulings, particularly civil society as the ability access to funds is really uh, really uh, kind of defines their ability to push for greater compliance at the national levels. But also uh, the same, same applies for the Council of Europe uh, initiatives aimed uh, at uh, uh, in this area. Uh, so I'll let uh, Julieta to go to the two remaining recommendations. Uh, I'll just stop sharing. Thank you very much, Nina, for presenting the CGEU part and the recommendation. And I'm going to switch moment over to Julieta back for the other recommendations, and then we will move into the QA. Julieta, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jakub, and thank you, Nina, for the excellent presentation of the CJU part and the first part of the recommendations, which actually actually appears second uh, in in our actual document. The the um, the sequence was uh, inversed for for the purposes of this presentation, but uh, actually the the remaining two recommendations that I'm going to present. Uh, appear first in the document because exactly are the ones that are the most global and and um, the most um, the, the ones that concern equally the both jurisdictions so to say. So the first one uh, has to do with the integration of implementation data. Uh, we specifically recommend to the European Commission to continue incorporating ECTHR judgment implementation data into its annual rule of law report and systematically analyze and prominently feature compliance with CG. EU rulings. Um, this is because, on one hand, as we saw, failure to adhere to these specific um, uh, to specific rulings um, linked to checks and balances can in di can directly impact uh, their quality and the overall uh, state of the rule of law in a given uh, member state. Um, but uh, which links to the. Um, rule of law problem in the narrow sense, as, as we described it earlier. At the same time, uh, it is of critical import importance that the Commission reports do not lose sight of the overall level of implementation of uh, the Strasbourg and Luxembourg uh, court rulings, regardless of their thematic focus, with a view to accurately assessing and uh, addressing the impact of non-compliance with European court judgments uh, in, on the rule of law in the broadest sense, as we explained it earlier. Uh, the last remaining recommendation pertains to uh, our urge for targeted recommendations. Uh, we urge in particular the Commission to issue specific recommendations to states based on their implementation records uh, on the two courts' judgments related to the rule of law and to expand its reports to cover democracy and systemic fundamental rights violations, urging immediate action from states with recurring issues. Uh, we think that this is of um, uh, particular importance uh, that the Commission, at the very least, um, covers through specific recommendations uh, those rulings related to the independence and impartially, impartiality of the judiciary uh, in the strictest sense. Um, 
and to the protection of fundamental values that are necessary for maintaining a democratic way of life in a state governed by the rule of law. Such attention is particularly necessary when judgments have, of course, not been complied with over extended periods. Uh, but at the same time, the expansion of the report's scope is furthermore justified because the application of the rule of law and protection of human rights are interdependent and overlapping objectives. So allowing long-term non-implementation of rulings of the European courts on matters pertaining to democracy and systemic violations of fundamental rights to remain unaddressed ultimately contributes to the erosion of the rule of law in the wider sense of the term. Of course, in this uh, context, uh, we welcome that the 2024 edition of the European Commission's Rule of Law Report calls for a few selected members, for, for example, Belgium, to implement the final rulings of the court. Uh, this is noted and uh, highly appreciated, but it is nevertheless crucial that this approach be generalized and systematically applied to other member states, recording a similar or even more significant degree of failure to effectively implement not only Strasbourg, but also Luxembourg Court rulings. Uh, this concludes the presentation of the recommendations and of the overall report. Um, and um, uh, back to you, Jakub. Thank you very much, Julieta, for presenting those recommendations. We have now some 10 minutes for Q&A. So uh, our dear audience, if anybody wants to ask a question, please uh, raise the hand using the React function of Zoom and uh, we would love to hear from you. And in the meantime, while you're thinking about questions, I will maybe ask one of myself is uh, aimed at both of our panelists uh, because it touches both organizations and both courts in a way. How do you think, given the current situation and what the report covers, uh, uh, what would be the consequences and implications of the European Union acceding to the European Convention on Human Rights and the um, activities of the EU institutions and bodies and uh, member states uh, in part uh, becoming subject to scrutiny from the European Court of Human Rights? wants to take this one first, Greta? I think we agreed behind the scenes you were going to spare us, Jakub. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, this is a million dollar uh, question or the million euro question. Um, of course, a first uh, attempt uh, for the EU to accede the convention has uh, has failed spectacularly, as we all remember. A second attempt is in the making, and uh, it is uh, reported that uh, it is uh, quite progressed. Also, um, I, my my personal uh, view, al although both efforts do specify and and um and explain at least preliminary points of how implementation matters would also be approached uh it is my feeling that um and this is a personal feeling so i'm i i i open my my views to contestation that uh if adherence to the to the uh, to the supremacy of the Strasbourg court um, findings and, and case law is not something we agree upon and we don't get back to before this happens, will not be resolved if uh, and when this accession of the EU happens. Um, the, through the accession, uh, a different level of, of problems uh, faced by uh, the member states and the citizens in the member states will be, of course, addressed in a different manner. Uh, if we have not resolved the, the simpler problems through the simpler approach of, um, of state-based um, adherence to the convention, uh, it will be much more complicated to do so um, when finally the EU accedes. Although, while saying that, I am by all means all for uh, the accession um, effort and, and construction, uh, because only by doing so can we uh, effectively address uh, problems that can uh, now fall through the cracks of the interplay of the two systems. So in the end, I think... Um, uh, accession also implementation wise will 
help better address the problems that now plague the jurisdictions. But at implementation level, we need to uh, reconfirm uh, first our adherence uh, to, to the convention standards and the political will uh, to, um, to respect the authority of the court. Otherwise, we will possibly be facing bigger problems than we are faced with now. Uh, yeah, I will just yeah. give a brief response. My uh, initial thinking is that any extra uh, supervision and enforcement mechanism to reveal and uh, sort of condemn the violations, whether it's EU law or human rights law, is a good news. However, in terms of complexity of how it will play out and the workload that it will create for the court and also the implementation issue, uh, yeah, it remains to be seen how that will play out, but it's a pretty challenging path, I would say. Thank you. We have a question from uh, uh, Pablo Rufos about the uh, part on the European Court of Human Rights regarding the categorization of uh, uh, related to rights in detention, different one for migration, and how does it um, mean uh, assessing compliance of violations against detained migrant refugees? Uh, perhaps, uh, Julieta, you can uh, uh, speak to this. Thank you, um, and, and thank you uh, for the question to the colleague. Uh, first of all, um, I need to stress once again that um, the thematic uh, research, at least in respect of the Strasbourg Court, did not go uh, into the, the depth that this thematic deserves. Um, for, for technical reasons this time, this will be the subject matter of, um, of next year's report. This is one issue. And then... The uh, the second um, the second element that needs to be pointed out is that uh, the the qualitative part of the report, so the look into the themes, only complements uh, our assessment. It does not form the basis of our assessment. So um, we have not measured in particular um, how how many judgments are unimplemented in respect of each thematic category so as to form our overall assessment. Uh, those are two different, uh, two, two slightly different things. Uh, so the classification of Greece uh, as problematic is a combination of many different factors, um, which we explain and which are uniform for all member states. Uh, then looking into the overall situation, we um, we also assess uh, thematically and evaluate thematically uh, certain areas that can be bigger bigger um, uh, sources of concern and bigger sources of stumbling blocks. Uh, in this sense, uh, uh, detention issues refer to the conditions of detention uh, in in general. Uh, for the purposes of this report. And there, on the basis of these considerations, Greece falls into um, the same problematic category like an, an, another number of, of uh, EU states uh, looked at into this report. Thank you very much, Julieta. And I think we have space for one more question. And we have uh, Paula Novak with the raised hand. Paula, the floor is yours. Unfortunately, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, I have a question, actually. I'm from the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions. And first of all, big congratulations on your report. Uh, very important information and data that also national human rights institutions use and refer to. Um, my question regards the problem of undermining the supremacy of the uh, Strasbourg Court's judgments, which Julieta touched upon in your uh, in your comment. And I wonder whether, in light of the current situation with the reactions of the governments, and particularly the Swiss government, to the judgment of the Strasbourg Court in the climate case of Klima Seniorinen, um, whether that problem has been more highlighted in your report or whether you 
saw through your analysis of the national situations, that problem is becoming more and more and more uh, seen. Uh, because I think that uh, in our work and in view of the work of the national human rights institutions, that problem um, becomes more and more important and it's happening in more countries. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Paula, uh, also for for your interest in this report uh, uh, through your role also as a part of the Secretariat of ENRI, with whom we have a very good cooperation, and, and you yourselves have been contributing to the rule of law uh, reports, uh, which is highly appreciated because this amplifies the voices that uh, touch upon this very important matter. Uh, thank you for your question. In this respect, we do mention the Swiss judgment, the Klima Seniorin judgment, in the report as a land development because it is the first time uh, that the court went towards the uh, direction of uh, finding a violation, uh, labeling it as a climate um, uh, change related case. Um, we could not go farther than that in the context of this report because the judgment became final this year. So the thematic analysis will be performed in the edition of next year. And uh, although we, I, I don't want to bridge, prejudge uh, our themes um, for next year, I have the impression that uh, we will inevitably look into this matter. And by then, perhaps we will have it, uh, even uh, potentially new judgments because uh, a number of complaints are pending before the court. Uh, it goes without saying that it is a landmark decision um, from from our Strasbourg court, uh, which um, opens a uh, discussion which was already open in terms of problematic, but opens it also at the le level of Strasbourg institutions. Um, we have seen already the response of the Swiss uh, government, which was one of resistance, uh, which is problematic in itself. This is exactly what we are trying to, um, to combat. Uh, we were happy to note uh, the immediate reaction of the new Secretary General, uh, a Swiss national uh, and former Prime Minister himself, who uh, uh, immediately uh, took a stance uh, saying the self-evident, which is that uh, Strasbourg court judgments are, um, are are binding upon member states. We cannot cherry pick. Uh, uh, giving this... Uh... Sorry, Jakub, is all okay? Uh, yes, yes, go on, go on, go on. I have some technical yes. glitch here. So, so this, this type of response is exactly what we're trying to avoid, because these types of responses immediately place uh, otherwise state, uh, otherwise compliant member states uh, into the category of, uh, of uh, pockets of resistance. I understand the difficulties. I understand that climate cases present a different type of problems we will need to sit around not just lawyers politicians etc the same group of people that were sitting around the table determining determining the measures to be taken we will have to bring in climate um, experts climate specialists so the, the the procedure is going to be a bit different technically perhaps but the core of the principle remains that it is a Strasbourg court judgment which is binding and we need to find a way to move forward uh, so as uh, this not to become um, a stumbling block. I think that also with new instruments that are in the making in Strasbourg level and beyond, uh, there will be also ways to overcome this uh, this uh, impasse. But of course, if this is a whole new chapter that will uh, will concern us very much in the future editions of the report. And if I may come back very quickly to Pavlos's question, because I saw it now in writing, uh, and I have the complete picture of his question. You asked Pavlo, you mentioned that uh, how does the immigration detention comes into play and is measured um, uh, in, in relation to rights in detention in relation to European citizens? <clears throat> So I just wanted to complete my answer by saying that, of course, uh, complaints before the the court uh, do not have to do with the, the 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 nationality of the applicants, but rather with the member state that caused the violation. And and in this sense, uh, if a state is responsible for a violation, uh, it cannot only be held responsible in terms of uh, violations against its own national. So if if violations have happened in relation to persons in detention 
um, of a different nationality, uh, this of course falls into the scope of the relevant research. Uh, the remaining elements about how and to which extent uh, specific categories of uh, detainees and, and judgments related to them have influenced our numbers, uh, what I said before exists, uh, stands still as explanation. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a final um, uh, uh, thing in our event, we have a question from Sidonia Bogdan. Uh, can you tell us who are the top three countries that do not follow court rulings uh, and what are the major problems when it comes to Romania? Nina and Juliet are the top three worst performers in respective parts. And of course, maybe a word about uh, particular Romanian situations. And that will be our last uh, uh, act of this meeting. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll start quickly. So Romania is indeed one uh, out of the top uh, non-performers uh, in this, alongside Bulgaria and Hungary. Uh, and Poland is also on that list in terms of struggling with compliance. Uh, and uh, what are the major problems in our data set, and the report covers it also qualitatively, uh, th there are a few issues. Many of the issues had to do with the pressure on judges. Uh, it had to do with the use of discipline, abuse of disciplinary mechanisms, inspectorate, uh, in particular disciplinary body, and then also the body that was supposed to investigate cases uh, against judges. There were some reforms. So main issue that the experts have in this regard is that those reforms were not uh, adequate in some respects. So in some ways it was uh, satisfactory, but in other ways it was not and definitely overall not sufficient. So the uh, that's why it falls significantly under the partial compliance uh, sort of a category in a way if you look at the performance. Yeah, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Nino. Very quickly on my side as well, with thanks for the question uh, to our colleague. Uh, the the first, uh, the, the the three uh, worst performing countries in the in respect of the Strasbourg Court judgments are Romania, Poland, and Italy, but very closely followed by Hungary in particular, and then by Bulgaria. So I would not necessarily. <coughs> excuse me, exclude them from that enumeration. In respect of those five countries, we have very serious implementation uh, problems. It is no uh, wonder that uh, these countries all also are among the worst performance in the, uh, in the Luxembourg court system, as Nino just mentioned. Um, uh, the, the approach is a bit different and the, and the types of problems that uh, that um, make the situation problematic in each one of these jurisdictions uh, is, is a bit different. But uh, at least for Romania, indeed, independence of the judiciary is one problem. Um, the situation is a bit different compared to the EU system and how the EU system sees the Romanian efforts to resolve this problem. So uh, the, the judgments that were existing, the major complaints that were existing um, and were identified through violation finding judgments have been resolved at Strasbourg level. Uh, I'm talking about the um, the uh, Camilla Bogdan, um, the Camilla Bogdan case and um, um, it escapes me the name now of the second uh, landmark judgment. The Kevesi judgment, yes, indeed. Uh, so these judgments have been closed. Uh, we are aware uh, of, of problems that still exist in respect of the judiciary, independence of the judiciary. So despite the reform that has been adequately um, and, and satisfactorily uh, evaluated uh, by the Strasbourg institutions as a success, problems remain. Uh, the problem is that uh, those complaints have still not matured enough at Strasbourg level. So we're monitoring the situation. We're monitoring what the Luxembourg court says. We're waiting for new judgments to come in from the Strasbourg court to evaluate this, uh, these problems. We understand as EAN that the problem is far from resolved uh, in respect of the judiciary. We furthermore understand that um, uh, the Romanian authorities have not necessarily resolved the problem, uh, but have found ways to be more uh, inventive 
if you wish, uh, in the ways they they um, they harass the the judiciary. Uh, but all that needs to be, of course, uh, consolidated or refuted in new judgments that are awaited. Uh, until then, uh, we stay with what we have, um, and and what we have is is a clear picture, also also coming from 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 the Luxembourg court judgments in this respect. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Estonia is also asking if uh, both of our fantastic experts can be quoted uh, by media. I'm assuming that yes, as uh, this is a press briefing after all as well. And with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us. Apologize for running over the time slightly, but the questions were just too good to pass the opportunity to have them answered by our uh, fantastic experts. Uh, Julieta, you know, thank you very much. And the link to the report is in the chat, but you will also be able to find it on our organization's websites. And please follow us, um, our websites, our social media accounts for more news and updates about implementation of court judgments and other items. Once again, all of you, thank you very much. And I hope to see you all next year during the launch of the subsequent edition of the report. Thank you very much. Many thanks to you, Jakub, and to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.